For my 100th review on the Cartoon Palooza, it was agreed upon that I would be looking at an animated hit. Now what better movie to look at than The Lion King? Not only did it receive critical praise and a generous box office return, but for more than 20 years since it first premiered, it still stays relevant with a long-running Broadway play, sequels, spin-offs, and the achievement of highest grossing hand-drawn animated film of all time. If you want an idea on how big this movie was, let's compare it to the success of Frozen. Instead of Let It Go and Do You Wanna Build a Snowman, kids were singing Hakuna Matata and The Circle of Life. Imagine, instead of seeing a row of Olaf action figures, you replace them with Timon and Pumbaa and then give them a TV series. So if you think the Frozen craze is about to end soon, well, if history likes to repeat itself, then you're out of luck. What's more fascinating about this film was that during its production, nobody expected this movie to be as big of a hit as it set out to be. When the film was in production, it was a lesser known project simply called Bambi in the Jungle and the studio's biggest talent went into working on Pocahontas. When The Lion King came out, most trailers ended up spoiling the twist that Mufasa died and showed the whole movie in a passing montage. I know who you are. You're Mufasa's boy. Who's Mufasa? Correction, I know your father. He died. What? He's dead? Who? Who is this? What the hell? With Pocahontas, it was marketed as this huge cultural event. The first trailer I saw only featured the Colors of the Wind song with a few clips edited in from the movie. And this was on the Lion King VHS of all places. Call that irony. This was so much hype for Pocahontas, the studio premiered the movie in Central Park for thousands of New Yorkers to see, and it got rained on. I would know this because I was there. And it really stunk that my parents decided not to take me to the rain date. Hello darkness, my old friend. So before the video becomes a Pocahontas comparison, the bottom line was that, while this movie only made a decent box office run and mixed reviews, The Lion King ruled superior a year prior to the movie. So what is it about The Lion King that makes it rain superior? I crack myself up sometimes. At the very least, it's a Disney animated movie, so expect common tropes and good animation we come to expect from the studio. However, the film mixes themes of religion, betrayal, and family dysfunction. And sometimes the film manages to excel in those themes, while other times... Well, um, it's hard to say, but while I think it's a good movie, the film does have its share of issues. Remember when I said the film was best described as Bambi in the Jungle? Well, let that sink in, because both films feature a coming-of-age story where a young protagonist destined to be king of their natural habitat learns about life through the caring parent figure and then witness said parent figure die a tragic death and eventually grow up to take his place as eventual king. Start the movie the same way the film ends the Hammer the Circle of Life message and there's your film. But when Bambi differs from The Lion King comes from its plot. When the film Bambi didn't really have a physical bad guy, it was more of a natural growth seeing a character learn about the world and deal with a looming threat that isn't in his control. With The Lion King, it feels more narrative driven, which can cause the film to fall into common tropes and cliches. Like, who ever felt it made sense to make Scar the only British lion while the rest speak like they're American? I feel when talking about this film, it's best to discuss each of the three acts. The first act is amazing. Within the first five minutes, you have the circle of life playing and it does well in establishing what we will know about the film. We learn that the king played magnificently by James Earl Jones gives birth to the sun. Wait, no, his wife gives birth to the sun. That would actually be kind of weird because lions don't play like that. Who take on the duties of king of the jungle. However, this means his brother Scar is passing the opportunity, who despite being a tactical manipulative ruler straight out of the song of ice and fire, is frowned upon. I love how he's introduced, showing us how he has a small talk with his meal. He doesn't merely eat the thing, he discusses the cruel facts of life where some people are more fortunate than others and have to deal with the harsh lessons of reality. Yeah, coming straight out of Disney, but I digress. Seeing Mufasa interact with a young Simba is one of the strengths of the film. Mufasa is probably one of the more positive father figures you'll see out of the studio, let alone film. He strikes discipline while showing how much he loves his son. 
Sadly, we don't see that connection with Simba and his mom, but when it comes to mothers and Disney's, well, it kind of expected for mothers to get the crap end of the stick. Speaking of dead Disney parents, Scar works with the hyenas, using their hatred for the lions as fuel to dethrone Mufasa by killing him in his ears. This leads to the best use of CG in the film, where a stampede of wildebeest trampled through Simba while Mufasa tries to save him. However, when things are going well and all Mufasa needs is Scar's help, then we get a great moment where Scar goes straight up Red Wedding and throws Mufasa off the cliff and into the horde of running wildebeest. All for Simba to witness for himself. The Lannisters and their regards. <laughs> you know how in Bambi where we know as soon as we hear the gunshot that his mother is dead, but then building up the suspense with the slow music and him searching for her eventually showing his deadbeat dad telling him the truth in a classic cinematic moment? Yeah, let's have Simba walk over, pick up at the dead corpse of his father, and then have his murderer convince him that it was his fault. Bambi has an edge over this scene, not only because less is more, and we don't need to have him stand around his dead father, and not because we see Bambi spend more screen time bonding with his mother than did Simba and Mufasa, but most importantly because of the message. Bambi comes to the realization that he needs to grow up on his own, where in the Lion King they keep bringing up death and, you know, circle of life. But the thing that makes this scene great is how it shows how straight up manipulative and despicable of a character Scar is. He manages to achieve what most Disney villains tried to do. His main goal was to take the throne by killing Mufasa and taking Simba out of the picture. What does he do? He takes the throne by killing Mufasa and taking Simba out of the picture. Look, as many of the other Disney villains and when they try to set out to do something, their plans mostly backfired. But by the time Simba sets things right, years have passed and Scar spends most of the film winning. Crap, I'm making another Game of Thrones reference, but in all seriousness, Scar belongs on that show. Literary villains who always get their comeuppance in hero stories, but creating the illusion of defeat is what makes the stakes higher and the villains more likable. Granted, he isn't nearly as calculating as he was at the start of the film, but to give him credit, he did what he set out to do. And if you want to judge a villain by his foresight, then give Jeremy Irons the credit he deserves. You have no idea. So while I mentioned how great the first act of the film, I personally think things take a slight dive for the worse when Simba runs away. He encounters Timon and Pumbaa, who as far as the tone set for this film, are there to lay out your pop culture references and move the plot along. Basically by convincing our hero to say, screw the past, YOLO in paradise, eat cockroaches for meals. I hope this doesn't give the impression that I hate Timon and Pumbaa, which I really don't. One of the best things to come out of this movie was their TV series, which was so removed from the movie and focused on acting like Looney Tunes, but when you have a movie dealing with death, betrayal, and the purpose you serve in life, the adult in me wishes they could have laid off the jokes a little more. Then again, after seeing a character you grow attached to die right in front of you, the kid in me appreciates it a little bit more, so what can I say, it's a mixed bag. But the thing that makes it feel a little worse is seeing our favorite villain turn into a whiny snob. You go from seeing him scheme and manipulate like a Shakespearean villain to complaining how it's the woman's job to do the hunting. I'm serious, it's in the film. It's the lion has his job to do the hunting. Freaking sexist. Things get a little better when Simba's childhood friend convinces him of all the wrongdoing Scar's been doing in his absence. This leads to a romantic subplot where the audience contemplates if it's wrong to see Simba want to get laid with his possible cousin. Seriously, rewatch the film. There are only two male adult lions on Pride Rock. Either Nala's father is a deadbeat, or there's some serious South Carolina inbreeding going on. Simba has quite literally knocked some sense into him when Rafiki tells him it's his duty to look after the Pride and how dealing with the issues of his past can help him learn how to be a better person. I actually have to give the film points here, but it's a pretty strong message to have in a film about growing up and dealing with your problems in a mature matter. Though the big issue comes near the end when Simba does go back to the Pride. Simba confesses that he was responsible for Mufasa's death and that this could have been a good opportunity for him to learn a lesson. But then, not much later, Scar confesses that he killed Mufasa and it makes it confusing because is he really learning a lesson if he didn't make the mistake that I learned the lesson? I don't know, it feels like all of this is happening way too fast to get the climactic battle between Scar's hyena army and Simba's friends. Now I wonder, I just wonder, do the good guys come out on top? Yeah, Simba defeats Scar, he's eaten by his hyenas, and the movie starts the same way it begins. Circle of life, y'all. Peace. 
So with all that said and done, does The Lion King deserve the praise it gets, so much so that movies today have to be constantly compared to being as good as The Lion King? Seriously, check out this blurb for The Princess and the Frog and Zootopia. They both mean the same thing. So when you say that movie's just as good as The Lion King, and then a few years later, another movie is just as good as The Lion King, does that mean the other movie that was just as good as The Lion King is suddenly not as good as The Lion King? <sighs> At the end of the day, The Lion King is one of those films that combines all the Disney tropes and cliches we know and love and showcases it on a large scale. I always love the theme of nature and how the natural progression of life is represented in a cycle. Which is ironic when you have to give the film a bad guy because the movie is about nature, then let nature be the villain. Hate to say it again, but much like Bambi. Man was never a character but more of a force that could not be controlled. The filmmakers didn't need to hammer the circle of life message like they did in The Lion King, which is what gives Bambi a slight edge over this film. But with that said, it still has a great story, likable characters, and despite the plot that can feel rushed just so we can see our hero have his happy ending, is still very enjoyable. The Lion King, after a few decades, still gets a worth it rating in my book. And I did this whole review without mentioning Ozama Tezuka's Kimba and the White Lion. <sighs> another video for another time, guys.